both at Yad Vashem in Israel and while I was in Poland, I learned about the victims of the Holocaust and their experiences, and I wondered about their lives in their hometowns where they grew up before they were murdered by the Nazis. What was their culture? What were they interested in? What was the literature, the music, that was a part of their everyday lives? That kind of thought is what led my stepfather, Michael Kessler, to initiate, together with the East Brunswick Public Library, this annual series of programs on the history, the culture, and the music of Eastern European Jewry before the Shoah. The first one took place two years ago and was on the Jews of Ukraine. The second one last year was on the Jews of Poland. This year, we are highlighting the Jews of Tsarist Russia before World War II. There will be an emphasis on Jewish music and its influence on Russian culture. We will also note the cooperation between Russian composers, literati, and upper echelons of Russian intelligentsia. I've been uh, asked to go through with you a little bit the history of the Jews of Russia and a little bit about Jewish music in Russia, so that's what I'm going to do. But I'd like to begin with um, a question you may be familiar with that appears in Fiddler on the Roof, where Tevye asks God, Oh God, I know that you have made us the chosen people, but uh, could you please choose somebody else for a change? <laughs> and this really sparked for me a whole set of associations because I think... What Tevi is saying is what a lot of people, Jews especially, feel about Jewish history, and that is it really is a long chain of suffering and persecution. And Tevi could be forgiven for perceiving Jewish history in that way. He went through a lot, as did any Jew living in the early 20th century. Of course, Tevi is a fictional uh, character, but you know he represents really an ethos. I would like to broaden our perspective a little bit on Russian Jewish history by suggesting that there was a reason why so many Jews of the world, really three-fourths of the world's Jewish population, wound up there by the 19th century. And what I'd like to suggest is that uh, the Jews had managed to achieve their relatively secure and prosperous existence and this only really began to break down to a great extent with pogroms and eventually the Holocaust rather late in the game, towards the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. But there are centuries preceding that, um, as I said, of, of a certain kind of coexistence between Jews and Christians. Another aspect that I think might be left out of the victimization narrative is the rich cultural heritage. You have, as I'm going to talk about, the emergence of several vital and distinctive cultural expressions, everything from the popular mystical movement known as Hasidism through the Jewish Enlightenment-oriented Haskalah and down to various forms of synthesis between Jewish and Russian culture manifested in music and other forms. Now, I think it's no coincidence that Fiddler on the Roof is playing on Broadway again. It's not because none of us have seen it. Probably all of us did, both the play and the movie. But the reason now is because our grandchildren and great-grandchildren want to be able to hear the the melodies, and learn the story. Because they, unlike their parents and sometimes even their grandparents, they desperately want to recapture the language and the culture and the music that had been transported by their great-grandparents from the lands on the other side of the sea. I can tell you that my grandchildren love it every time a Yiddish word rolls off of my tongue. They do everything they can to be able to pronounce it. 
They are proud members of a club that I f formed called Zadie Miller's Hakka China Club. <laughs> they have no idea what the words Hakka China mean. They're just proud members because they know that it's authentic. The music that we heard today is a reflection, and the, and the, um, the lecture that we got today is a reflection of Jewish authenticity, of how Jews managed to live, survive, and even more importantly, how they learned to thrive at a time when others might have just turned to drink or would have given up, would have abandoned all hope. And they took that ability to thrive and they trans transformed it into cultural wonder. How grateful all of us are and how lucky we are, not just that we're getting a remnant, but the remnant is beginning to grow again and touch the souls of the Jewish people wherever it is that we live. Uh, Call Kaplan. Uh, came to the library in 2013 and said to me, I have some money that I have nothing to do with, and I thought you could use it. And, I, and that is music to a, a director's ears, of course. But actually, uh, what I discovered in our conversation, uh, Carl and I bonded like immediately, and, and because we're both Brooklyn people, and also because... Uh, his heart was so huge, and he explained to me that the Holocaust collection that was in this library already that I knew about for many, many years because I did reference and I, I used it so heavily, uh, Carl explained to me that that had been started by him and the East Brunswick Jewish Center because he who, whose family was not in the Holocaust he felt a great responsibility that, that the people here should never forget those that went through this time in history. And one of the things that I so appreciated about Carl was that he said, I don't want it to just be in the temples and, and, and the shuls. Uh, I need this story to get out to others. And I certainly was one of those others. And I deeply appreciated the fact that um, he introduced me to Michael Kessler. And, and look what has happened because of that introduction. Mm -hmm.